We have come to worship the God who makes streams flow from the rock, who turns the parched earth into springs of water, who sends the rain from the heaven and makes the wilderness blossom and flourish. As the deer thirsts after flowing streams, so we thirst for God. Brothers and sisters, come let us worship our life-giving God, the God who pours out living water on all who thirst. Let us pray. Father God, here we are once again in your presence. It almost overwhelms us when we try to fathom what that truly means. Do great things among us today as you did with those disciples in the upper room so very long ago. Help us to have the good sense to stay out of the way. All of our most noble plans and ideals are futile without your presence. Today, let us feel you, let us hear you as we turn our hearts towards you. Remove from within us anything that would keep, keep us from worshiping you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Renew us with an energized faith. Affirm us as your people here to worship and celebrate with strength and courage and hope. In Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. It's with the warmest of greetings and salutations that we welcome all of you as we worship the Lord in spirit and truth today. May God's richest blessings rest upon each and every one of you. Whether you're visiting with us for the very first time or your viewing is of a much more serial nature, we're grateful for your presence and, and hope that this podcast provides inspiration and encouragement for you and yours. If you haven't already done so, then we encourage you to bookmark this page for easy reference in the future. You can find an archive of our past podcast on YouTube. Just simply log on to YouTube.com and in that search box, type in Altered States. That's A-L-T-A-R-E-D, Altered States. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button and click that notify bell icon so that you'll know whenever new content is posted. In these very trying times, everybody could use just a little bit of inspiration and encouragement. And so we invite you to start each day with our short devotionals as a matter of faith located on our Facebook page. On Facebook, if you'll just simply uh, search for Hickory Ridge UMC, that's one word, Hickory Ridge UMC. And in the amount of time that it takes you to check your emails, you can add just a little bit of God's light into your life. So be sure and check us out each day on Facebook. Since President Trump's announcement at the end of last week in which he deemed all churches as essential and thus paved the way for us to reopen, some of you have been asking when indeed our worship services might resume. The Western North Carolina Conference has recommended that we remain closed until further notice. In consultation with some of the leadership of our church, it has been decided that we will seek to comply with the conference's recommendation for the next two weeks and or until it's rescinded, if sooner. Now, during the time that the church has been closed, it doesn't mean that we have been inactive. There's been an awful lot of work going on behind the scenes. We have been working, formulating a set of guidelines and protocols to be put into action once we do reopen. We are confident that these measures that we've come up with will be successful in allowing us to resume our worship services while mitigating the spread of uh, the COVID-19 virus. If you would like to receive a list of these guidelines and protocols, if you'll just get in touch with a pastor, he will be more than happy to forward those to you. At the end of two weeks, if the annual conference has not relaxed their restrictions or altered their recommendation, the leadership of Hickory Ridge will revisit and reevaluate their decision, and we will let you know at that time uh, how we will proceed. One of the things that becomes obvious in life is that we don't, don't stop long enough to listen to the still speaking God. And like the people of Israel so very long ago, we very often misunderstand how the Spirit 
moves within us. As we slow down and switch gears and uh, get still and, beside, and silent before the Lord, we take an opportunity to draw near to the Lord and listen, to hear what He has to say. Let us begin our time of prayer this morning by confessing together. Spirit of God, you come to us as a powerful wind, but we have shut the door and bolted it to try to keep you out. You've descended on us as tongues of fire, but we run away, afraid of being consumed. You give us gifts beyond our ability, but we squander them. We hide them. We say, oh, not today, or how can one person possibly make a difference? Or no, Lord, not me. We profess a moral superiority that's really nothing more than a cowardice clothed in theological robes. On this day of Pentecost, forgive our feebleness. Break open the doors of resistance. Let the fire of the Spirit dance within each of us and give us courage and faith to claim your call for our lives. In Jesus' name. My children, hear this good news that the Spirit of God has been poured out upon all flesh and we have all been made one. We are no longer scattered or divided. We are gathered together to build up the kingdom of God here on this earth. So thanks be to God. For in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins have been forgiven. As Christ sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes on our behalf, so we, as the Christ body, seek to intercede on behalf of those in our church and community who are afflicted with illness or overcome by circumstances. If you find that you have a need and that we would like to pray with you and for you, you can request that your concern be added to our uh, corporate and private prayer list by sending that concern via email to preacher.bob at aol.com. That's preacher.bob at aol.com. Let us pray. Most merciful God, as we come in prayer this morning, we're thankful for that celebrated Pentecost spirit that came upon your people. Send those same flames upon us as we worship today. We long to be your witnesses to live the lives and speak the words that transform. We're thankful for the gifts that you sent upon us. May they become manifest in every single one of us. Give us the strength and power as we utter prayers today for uh, those we name in our hearts and with our lips, for those who are blind and cannot see, and for those who can see but are blind to people around them, for those who move slowly because of accident or illness or disability, for those who move too fast to be aware of the world in which they live, for those who are deaf and can't hear, for those who can hear but ignore the cries of others. For those who learn slowly. For those who learn in different ways and for people who learn quickly and easily but choose ignorance instead. For those who have chronic illness for which there is no known cure or relief. For those who live in unholy fear of developing a chronic illness for family, friends, and caregivers who serve those with disabilities, for those who feel awkward in their presence, for those who think they're worthless and beyond your love, for people who think they don't need your love, and for those who feel isolated by their disabilities, for people who contribute to that sense of isolation. In the quiet of these, this time, we lift up all of your creation that we might learn to respect each other and how we can live together in your peace. All of this in the name of the one who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread 
forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Over the last couple of months, virtually all of our gatherings and services have been postponed in the interest of public health. But because the church as a whole has been shut down, it doesn't mean that the ministries of the church or the needs that those ministries address uh, have gone away. It's not true. In many cases, those needs are as severe or more so now than they were before. Don't forget to send your tithe, your contribution, your gift, so that these very important ministries can continue. And may God bless your generosity. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and make all things new. Receive these offerings of our lives, our labor. Use them to spread the good news of the abundant life in Jesus Christ throughout all the earth. To the glory of your name, we pray. Amen. On this Pentecost Sunday, we begin our look at the scriptures this morning with the, uh, with the story of the very first Pentecost experience. We find that in the second chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 21. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and without any warning, there was this sound like a, like a strong wind, gale force, and nobody could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building, and then like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread throughout their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. Now, there were a lot of Jews staying in Jerusalem at that time, devout pilgrims who had come from all over the world, and when they heard that sound, they came on the run. And when they were there, they heard one after another their own mother tongues being spoken, and and they were thunderstruck. They couldn't, for the life of them, figure out what was going on. They kept saying, aren't these Galileans? How How is it that we're hearing them speak in our various mother tongues? They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head nor tail of it. They talked back and forth, confused, wondering what's going on here. But there were others that were joking. Oh, they're just drunk on cheap wine. And that's when Peter stood up and backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These folks are not drunk like you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel predicted would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of person. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And when the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on all of those that serve me, men and women alike, and they'll prophesy. And I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, sun turning black and the moon blood red before the day of the Lord arrives the day tremendous and marvelous. And whoever calls out for help to me, God, that one will be saved. Our second reading this morning is from Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3 through 13. Now, what I want to talk about now is the various ways that the Spirit of God gets worked into our lives. It's complex and it's very often misunderstood, but I, I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Now, remember how you were when you didn't know God? You were 
led from, from one phony God to another, never knowing quite what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else was doing it. Well, this is a different kind of life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek, to understand as well as we can. For instance, by using your head, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt anybody to say, Jesus be damned. Neither would anybody be inclined to say that Jesus is master without the insight of the Holy Spirit. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everybody gets in on it. Everybody benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit to all kinds of people. And the variety is amazing. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin but are handed out one by one by the Spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. Now you can easily see how this kind of thing works by really looking no further than your own body. Your body has many different parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. Well, it's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives we each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a very large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. This is exactly what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us now is part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit. That's where all of us come to drink. All those old labels we used to once identify ourselves, labels like Jew and Greek, slave and free, well, those are no longer useful. Now we need something larger, something much more comprehensive. Let us pray. Father, as we seek to open the word for hearing and proclamation, let your voice be the one that speaks clearly above all others. Open our hearts and minds that we may receive understanding, clarity, courage that we can put these principles into work in our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. The text for the message this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, Verses 19 through 23. Now, later on that day, the disciples had come together, but because they were afraid of the Jews, they had locked all the doors in the house. And then suddenly Jesus entered, stood among them, and he said, peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. And Jesus repeated the greeting. He said, peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I now send you. And then he took a deep breath and he breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. And if you don't forgive sin, then what are you going to do with them? Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The great novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote that there are no second acts in American lives, but Fitzgerald was wrong. There are, in fact, plenty of them. Take Ken, for instance. 
As a child, all he ever really wanted to be was a doctor. Uh, when he got of age, he did pre-med at Duke University, then went to medical school at the University of North Carolina. And after he completed his residency in New Orleans, he went to Los Angeles where he began to practice medicine. Well, along the way, he got bit by the acting bug, and he started doing stand-up comedy as well as auditioning for other acting parts. Everybody that knew Ken was shocked by this. Even Ken said, I, I never even did theater in high school. And then one day he gets his break in a series of movies, new movies. He, he started in a sitcom called Dr. Ken, his name is Ken Jong, and he is now a full-time comedian and actor. Entertainment is his second act. But Dr. Ken still renews his medical license every year, and once in a great while, he still gets to use it. Once he jumped off the stage during the time he was doing a stand-up routine to help a woman who was in the audience and having a seizure. He admits you just can't take the doctor out of you. Another example we have this time from American history is from Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt was a big star in the New York legislature. He had a very wildly successful first act in his life and his career. And then his wife died and his mother died on the very same day when he was 25 years old and that was a life-changing experience for him. He was devastated. In order to escape his depression, he went to the Badlands and that's where he spent 15 hours a day riding his horse. And in time, when he felt like he was ready to go to work again, he decided to take whatever job would come his way. So he started out working as head as the U.S. Civil Service Commission and then as New York City Police Commissioner. And next, he joined the U.S. Army where his leadership qualities developed. He became the governor of New York. He became the vice president of the United States. And finally, he was elected president and his image was later chiseled into the cliffs at Mount Rushmore. No second acts? Well, that's absurd. Teddy Roosevelt himself had second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh acts. It was a winding path to leadership, and it made him better because he had all these different horizontal experiences. He would not have become an excellent president unless he had had these various other different jobs, some of which were horizontal, but all of which were extremely valuable. On that first Easter morning, the disciples were very understandably traumatized. Mary Magdalene had just come to tell them that she had seen the Lord but they were yet to see Jesus with their own eyes. It's quite likely they were suffering from the effects of PTSD from all the recent events that had taken place, his, his trial, his crucifixion. They were scared. And John tells us that the doors of the house in which they were staying were locked because they were afraid of the Jews. Well, see, now they've entered, into a, they've entered into a time of their lives when really all bets are off. After the religious authorities had acted uh, the way they had when they confronted Jesus by killing him in such a brutal way, nobody knew what kind of violence they were going to uh, visit upon the disciples if they ever decided to, to go after them. That first act of the disciples was over, and the second act, well, the second act really didn't look all that promising. Then without any warning at all, Jesus passes right through those locked doors and he appears in their midst. Peace be with you. And then he goes around the room and he shows them uh, the marks of the crucifixion that were left on his body, his hands, his side, all of these proofs that it was really, it was really him. 
Now, for those disciples that were gathered there, this was the beginning of their second act. That grief they had experienced at the death of Jesus was now replaced by joy. The despair that they felt was very quickly transformed into hope. Jesus had promised them that their pain would turn into joy, and and his appearance proved to them uh, this promise. So Jesus says to them again, he says, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Before they could even process the good news of the resurrection, Jesus was sending them on a mission. Now notice what happens here at the beginning of this second act. Action. Ken Jeong didn't quit medicine to sit around by a swimming pool in Los Angeles. Teddy Roosevelt didn't hang out in the Badlands forever. They both jumped into action. They both began pursuing new passions. They both took a leap of faith, fully aware that comedy offered less job security than medicine and that working for the Civil Service Commission was not a clear path to success. Jesus ordered those disciples to jump even while they were cowering behind locked doors like little girls. I send you, he said, right before he pushed them back out into the world. The second acts can be uncertain. Second acts can be scary. The skills that are gained from horizontal experiences are are indeed valuable, but they're not any guarantee of success. But still, regardless, Jesus calls his followers to act. So after telling them that he's going to send them out, Jesus breathes into them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it's obvious at this point that that Jesus was not going to send them out into their second act without having some kind of power. Jesus knew that it would not be fair in any way, shape, or form to push them out into the world without giving them the gifts that they needed in order to be effective. So he breathes on them and they received the Holy Spirit. He inspired them on the Easter day with the very same Holy Spirit that would come on those disciples in a rush of mighty wind on that day of Pentecost. Now notice how this connects with other scriptures. When Jesus breathes into the disciples, We are reminded that God breathed life into Adam in Genesis. We are reminded of the breathing that took place in Ezekiel in which God told him to say to the dry bones, breathe upon these slain that they may live. Jesus breathing the Spirit on his disciples is a way of describing this new second creation those that believe in Jesus receive new life as the children of God. Second act, second creation, new life, new inspiration. That's the power that the risen Jesus breathed into his followers. Now, Jesus also empowered the disciples to forgive. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. Here, Jesus is empowering his followers to complete his mission in the world. Since the mission of Jesus is all about forgiveness and helping people to be right with God, then that means our work as his followers is to be all about forgiveness and helping people in the world be right with God. And so these disciples now have entered into their second act. A second act that involves action and power and forgiveness. 
Jesus sends them out on a mission, fills them with the power of the Holy Spirit, gives them the ability to forgive sins and to help people be right with God. And boys and girls, the very same thing is true of you and I. Whether it's medical doctors contemplating comedy or elected officials struggling with grief, our first act is not our last act. Through the coming of Jesus, we're being called into action. We're being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're being given the power to forgive and restore people to right relationships. When Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove was a student at Eastern College, he was trying to figure out what it meant, what it really meant to be a disciple of Jesus. And so he met over breakfast every two weeks with the president of the college, a man by the name of David Black. Jonathan was impressed by David. It was unusual for presidents to uh, lower themselves, as it were, to meet regularly with undergraduates. And whenever they would get together, the president would remind Jonathan that Jesus, in the words of Philippians 2.7, was a person of no reputation. So Jonathan thought about that a great deal because he knew that we live in a world that is obsessed with people and their reputations. Competition is constant. People are always trying to get ahead, in, whether it's in their education or their careers or in their personal lives. Parents compete with one another through their children. The first act of life seems to be focused on establishing a reputation and getting ahead of the competition. But maybe Jesus is calling us into a second act, one that includes a different kind of action and helps us get right with God. Perhaps this second act can be powered by the Holy Spirit and focused on service to others. Jonathan caught a glimpse of this while he was still student. One summer while he was in college, he volunteered to help students move into the dorms. So lugging boxes up the stairs for about the, the umpty umpth time, he bumped into a middle-aged man in shorts and a dirty t-shirt. He was breathing heavily, and like those of us who have a little bit of age on us, whenever he would move, stoop, he would let out a grunt. <laughs> So Jonathan peered over his boxes and apologized. And it was by that time he saw the man's face. Guess who it was? It was the college president, David Black. Every time he wondered what it meant to be a man of reputation, this image would immediately come into his mind. This president dressed in a soaked, dirty T-shirt, carrying boxes and meeting new students as their servant before he was introduced to them as their president. Whoever you are, wherever you are in life, we can have a second act. We can follow Jesus in a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit, one that is focused on action, power, forgiveness, and service. Christ has it for us. Let us seek it. Let us pray. And gracious God, what a gift it is to be your church. It's a role that we don't want to take lightly. We need unity, we need your guidance, we want to make the best representation we can to a world that is just distorted and broken. Thank you for rooting us in Christ and gifting us with the Holy Spirit. Open our eyes that we might know the presence of your Spirit. When we fall short, grant us your grace. When we succeed, may you receive all the glory. We're your church. May all that we do and say be only for your sake and for the greatness of your name. Amen. Church, as you seek to go forth in this place, remember who you are. 
remember your call. Remember that Christ has placed his hope in you. So go with boldness, go with grace, go with confidence, go now. Knowing that Christ goes with you. May the world be changed because the church is offering life and love to the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.